it could blow up on the pad. Anytime you've got 33 engines that all have to work together, that's there's definitely a chance. Well, I'm not quite in Texas yet. Many of you have asked when I'm moving. That'll be in mid-February. But if I were down there, I would have been down at Starbase because they just completed their first full flight-like wet dress rehearsal. So this was the first time an integrated ship and booster were fully loaded with more than 10 million pounds of propellant. And lucky for all of us who couldn't be down there in person, we have this awesome video from SpaceX. Now, of course, this test will help verify a full launch countdown sequence as well as the performance of Starship and the orbital pad for flight-like operations. I'm also not in Texas right now because I'm in the Washington, D.C. area at the AIAA SciTech Forum, and I ran into Chris Combs. He might follow him on Twitter. He specializes in hypersonics, aerospace engineering, propulsion, lasers. Look at his eyes. I'm surprised I didn't get laser eyes after talking to him. But we talked about Starship and it was perfect timing because we had that wet dress rehearsal. Speaking of getting places faster, what do you think about the you know proposed Starship point to point travel and also just Starship in general? Well, so I'm actually, believe it or not, some people wouldn't expect this from my uh, Twitter presence, right? I'm a Starship fan. I'm really interested in that. I think it's a neat thing. I just think sometimes people are a bit too optimistic and rosy about where it is and what it's right. about to be. Um, Cause I know they got a lot of smart people working on it, but I've seen firsthand these problems are hard. They're difficult to solve mm -hmm. and you can't just brute force your way um, past physics. I think in some ways a Starship point to point type approach might be is, is probably closer than like a hypersonic commercial vehicle that stays in the atmosphere. And the reason being that uh, Starship gets to cheat in the sense that it goes into space and doesn't have to worry about the problem the whole time. All right. Um, once you're outside of the atmosphere and not dealing with the arrow to the same extent, right. you can do some different things. And it's based on a rocket, which is a more mature technology compared to something like a scramjet. Sure. Right. Um, so in some ways, that's actually an easier problem. As crazy as that might sound, <laughs> the Starship is maybe an easier thing than some of the other stuff that we're dealing with. And so I see things like the tiles and mm -hmm. how do you deal with the thermal protection, right? Um, getting them to stay on during a test and the shuttle had the same types of growing pains. And then you've got a system that's got 33 engines and they're new engines, yeah. right? This is a, it's, it's a simple engine in that they've eliminated a lot of parts, but that also made things very complex and it relies on some advances in right. uh, turbo pump technology. So it's, you've got 33 engines that are going to be hard to get to work all at the same time. And maybe they're going to do it this week. I don't, you know, right. right. <laughs> Who knows? Um, or, or maybe it'll be next year. I, it's always hard to tell with stuff like that. Um, so I'm watching excitedly with a lot of people. And I think there's a lot of potential for Starship, whether it's point to point or getting things into orbit or whatever. Um, but I'm just, I have a patient approach with mm -hmm. it as well. Well, you're a fan of rapid iteration, and yeah. you know so is Elon and SpaceX. Why is that uh, a good approach to adopt, in your opinion? Yeah, um, so it's interesting because you can tell that Elon came from the software world, right? And there's a lot of things you can do in a code where you push it and you break it and then you fix it, right? And I think he brought that into engineering, and that can be a really good way to test, and it can be a really good way to make things happen fast. And so on the plus side, you learn a lot of things really quickly, right? Um, and every time you do a test, you're gathering a lot of data. And I think in a vacuum, a lot of people would say, if you could focus mostly on test, that might be better. And the closer to full scale you get, the more you're gonna learn about the real thing. The reason that we don't do that all the time costs a ton of money. It's a lot of resources. And hey, he's the richest person in the world, or he is was. close to it, was until recently, <laughs> sorry. Um, but he's, he's got resources, okay, that he can throw at that kind of stuff if he wants to. Um, the other side of it is when you compare to something like NASA, for example, or, or you know even like an Air Force program, when you have politicians watching over things, if you blow up a vehicle, that can not go over well all the time with people that aren't in that engineering mindset. Because, right. you know, for example, the last time they had a starship that came down and crash landed, yes. I said, that was awesome. And not because I was excited that it blew up. It was just, I said, 
they did 99% of what they wanted to do and it was almost a successful test yeah. and I'm sure they learned so much. That was great. But then you turn on the news the next morning and it was Elon's rocket explodes. Yeah. And um, I didn't really think that that was fair, but imagine if SLS did that. The yeah. program might be gone. Yeah. So not everyone has the luxury of testing like that for right. better or for worse. And so right. then, um, and then the other side of it is that you do eventually hit, run into a place or maybe you're not learning more from a full-scale test and you need to back up mm -hmm. and pick the problem apart and look at some smaller pieces of it and figure some things out. And sometimes I do wonder if they're, they kind of hit a wall with, all right, we need, to, we need to back up and slow down. And I think that some of that happens and that's why, you know, it's been a while since we saw Starship take off. So there's, there's limits to the full-scale rapid iteration too, right? You, it, it only does so much for you. So it does take a little bit of the more on the bench type work at the same time. Do you, a lot of people say they think it's just going to blow up on the pad. With the rocket, that's always one of the possibilities. And I mean, I think it, like Elon has the quote that success is one of the possibilities too, right? <laughs> true, I think um, so there's a, and there's a full spectrum in between of ranging from a, we hit a few of our objectives to all of them, right? Um, so it, it could blow up on the pad. Anytime you've got 33 engines that all have to work together, that's there's definitely a chance that that can happen. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with you know the the wet dress rehearsal and the static fire. Static and fire so yeah. there's because that's the other, I try and caution people because all right there's still several things that are going to need to happen before yes. and they you know people gave NASA a really hard time for SLS and you know the how long it took them from the first sort of launch attempt because they hadn't done a wet dress rehearsal and the launch attempt was sort of like a wet dress rehearsal mm -hmm. um, and. There, there's certain things that are just hard to get right, and it doesn't matter how bad you want to get them right or how motivated you are. They just take some practice and take some making some mistakes or fixing things or duct tape or whatever, right? Um, so they'll get there, but do they get there this week or next month or six months from now or whatever? I don't know. We're standing by waiting regardless. Right, um, yeah, I'll be watching intently. Last time that they did a, a Starship test launch, it actually coincided with a class I was teaching and I just stopped class and we <laughs> talked about the, the launch on the live stream. So I, I hope that it works out that way again. Now, of course, we still have to have that static fire with all 33 engines. And of course we need the FAA launch license, which has not been granted yet. So yes, this is progress, but it's not like tomorrow they're going to be launching Starship. In fact, March does seem pretty likely, but again, time will tell. I've been wrong in the past and I've learned that we just need to be patient. I'm hoping that with my move being in mid-February, I will be there just in time for the first orbital launch so i'm definitely following this very closely and yes this video is a little bit outdated considering the wet dress rehearsal was on the 23rd but i am here in the washington dc area uh working really hard at the aiaa conference because there are so many amazing people to interview and that i've already interviewed so i'm going to have some really great content that I'll be putting out for you guys, but I couldn't ignore this because I've been covering Starship now for quite some time. I made my first trip back there in September of 2021. So yes, I, like many of us, have been waiting and eagerly anticipating uh, the launch and so, here we go. But it was really great to get Chris Combs insight about this. And so I hope that you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already subscribed to Ellie in Space, it's completely free and it really helps the channel. So please hit the subscribe button and I'll see you in the next video.